Hello, welcome to Tales and Travels. We may not be able to travel the world this year, so we're bringing travel to you. My name is Beth Bell, and I'm the branch manager at the West Ashley Library. Today, I'm going to take you to Newgrange in Ireland, and then I'm going to share an Irish folktale with you. Have you ever been to Ireland? Ever wanted to visit Ireland? Today we're traveling to Newgrange in Ireland. Newgrange is a large circular passage tomb located in Boyne Valley. It was built over 5,000 years ago, which makes it older than Stonehenge and the Egyptian pyramids. I find that very fascinating. I hope you do too. It was built by Stone Age farmers. These farmers were very prosperous because the soil was rich and they also raised animals such as cattle. Have you ever worked on a farm or maybe you have a garden? Can you imagine going out to weed with just a stone? I think that would be very time consuming and hard work. And they were doing acres of land this way, very successfully. The circular mound is surrounded by 97 large curbstones. These curbstones, some of them have been decorated. They're decorated with like circles and lines and spirals. If you were decorating one, what kind of decorations would you have put on it? The mound also has a passageway that's 62 feet long that goes to the center. The passageway opens up into three alcoves and in the alcoves are basin stones which is where the bodies would have been placed. The passage and chamber are aligned with the rising winter solstice sun. On December 21st, the chamber is flooded with light from one end to the other. Now, above the entranceway to the passage is a roof box. It's a rectangular box that is not usually found in mounds. This little box allows the sunlight to enter and it, this time of year it enters and reaches the chamber. How wonderful is this? Now it is so exciting and so many people want to watch this happen that they have to draw names in a lottery. So from December 19th through December 23rd 10 people are allowed each day to be in the chamber that morning to watch the sun enter the chamber through the roof box. Now, you can't give your ticket to somebody else. You, if you can't come and view it, you have to decline. And they pull 50 tickets and then 50 people on a wait list. To be able to enter it. The tickets are pulled by school children to help keep it more honest. I personally would love to be one of those 10 people in a chamber. How about you? Would you like to come and see the sun fill the chamber or partially fill the chamber? Now nobody knows exactly what the significance was of the sun coming and filling the chamber on the 21st. But it could have been that they're celebrating the end of a year and the beginning of a new year. Or it was suggested that they're celebrating the victory of life over death. Which one do you like better? Or maybe you have a different one that you think it might be. Anyway, I would love to get to go and see this ceremony. And I'm, you know, but I haven't had that call telling me to come watch. So now we're going to share an Irish folktale. Thank you. I'm going to 
tell you a tale from the book Celtic Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs, which is a public domain book, which I found through Authorama. The story is The Field of Ragweeds. One fine day in harvest, it was indeed a fine day because it was a holiday. Tom Fitzpatrick was taking a ramble through the ground and went along the sunny side of a hedge when all of a sudden he heard a clacking sort of noise a little before him in the hedge. Dear me, said Tom, but isn't it surprising to hear the stone chatter singing so late in the season? So Tom stole on, going on the tops of his toes to try if he could get a sight of what was making the noise to see if he was right in his guess. The noise stopped, but as Tom looked sharply through the bushes, what should he see in a nook of the hedge but a brown pitcher, which might hold about a gallon and a half of liquor? And by and by a little wee teeny tiny bit of an old man with a little hat stuck upon his top of his head and a leather apron hanging before him, pulled out a little wooden stool and stood up upon it and dipped a little cup into the pitcher. He took out the full of it and put it beside the stool and then sat down and began working on a heel piece on a bit of a shoe just fit for himself. Well, by the powers, said Tom to himself. I often heard tell of the leprechauns and to tell God's truth, I never rightly believed in them. But here's one of them in the real earnest. If I go knowingly to work, I'm a made man. They say a body must never take their eyes off them or they'll escape. Tom now stole on a little farther with his eye fixed on the little man just as a cat does with a mouse. So when he got up quite close to him, God bless your work, neighbor, said Tom. The little man raised up his head and said, Thank you kindly. I wonder you'd be working on the holiday, said Tom. That's my own business, not yours, was the reply. Well, maybe you'd be civil enough to tell us what you've got in the picture there, said Tom. That I will with pleasure, said he. It's good beer. Beer, said Tom. Thunder and fire, where did you get it? Where did I get it? Is it why I made it? And what do you think I made it of? Devil of one of me knows, said Tom. But of malt, I suppose. What else? There you're out. I made it of heath. Of heath, said Tom, bursting out laughing. Sure you don't think me a, such a fool as to believe that? Do as you please, said he. But what I tell you is the truth. Did you never hear tell of the Danes? Well, what about them, said Tom? Why, all the about them there is is that when they were here, they taught us to make beer out of the heath, and the secret's in my family ever since. Will you give a body a taste of your beer, said Tom? I'll tell you what it is, young man. It would be fitter for you to be looking after your father's property than to be bothering decent, quiet people with your foolish questions. There now, while you're idling away your time here, there's the cows have broken into the oats and are knocking the corn all about. Tom was so taken by surprise with this that he just on the very point of turning around when he recollected himself. So afraid that the like might happen again, he made a grab at the leprechaun and caught him up in his hand, but in his hurry he overset the pitcher and spilt all the beer so that he could not get a taste of it to tell what sort it was. He then swore that he would kill him if he did not show him where his money was. Tom looked so wicked and so bloody-minded that the little man was quite frightened. So, says he, Come along with me a couple of fields off, and I'll show you a crock of gold. So they went, and Tom held the leprechaun fast in his hand and never took his eyes from off him. Though they had to cross hedges and ditches and a crooked bit of bog, till at last they came to a great field all full of goldenrod. And the leprechaun pointed to a big goldenrod and says he, Dig under that golden rod and you'll get the great cock all full of guineas. Tom, in his hurry, had never thought of bringing a spade with him, so he made up his mind to run home and fetch one. And that he might know the place again, he took off one of his red garters and tied it around the golden rod. Then he said to the leprechaun, Swear you'll not take the garter away from that golden rod? And the leprechaun swore right away not to touch it. 
I suppose, said the leprechaun very civilly. You have no further occasion for me? No, says Tom. You may go away now, if you please, and God speed you, and may good luck attend you wherever you go. Well, goodbye to you, Tom Fitzpatrick, said the leprechaun. Uh, much good may it do you when you get it. So Tom ran for dear life till he came home and got a spade, then away with him as hard as he could go back to the field of goldenrods. But when he got there, lo and behold, not a goldenrod in the field, but had a garter the very model of his own tied about it and as to digging up the whole field that was all nonsense for there was more than 40 good Irish acres in it. So Tom came home again with his spade on his shoulder a little cooler than he went and many a hearty curse he gave the leprechaun every time he thought of the neat turn he had served. That's the tale of the field of ragweeds. <laughs>